Life and death stand side by side as we enter into Good Friday. Jesus reveals the power and glory of God even as he is put on trial and sentenced to death. Standing with the disciples at the foot of the cross, we pray for the whole world in the ancient bidding prayer as Christ's death offers life for us all. We gather in the solemn devotion, but always with the promise that the tree around which we assemble is indeed the tree of life. Beloved of God, we begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you join me in prayer? Almighty God, look with loving mercy on your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, to be given over to the hands of sinners, and to suffer death on the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. As we turn our hearts to the word of God, Today's service will provide a reflection on the seven last phrases that Christ uttered.
when they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by, looking on. And even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him. Imagine, if you will, the scene on Calvary's hill. Imagine the scene around those crosses. It is cold, it is callous, it is unfeeling. No doubt the soldiers had seen this many times before, so perhaps they are even bored with crucifixion. Perhaps these executioners had already conducted several crucifixions that week. We imagine that the first time they saw a crucifixion, they may have been moved by its brutality, but now they are calloused and without emotion. First, the soldiers begin with the cool process of nailing the criminal to a cross, then hoisting him up, the cross swaying forward, then back, until it is secured with wedges at the bottom to hold it upright in the hole. And when the task is done, they sit around the base waiting for the criminal to die sometimes for days. To pass the time, they gamble, deciding by a casting of lots who will be awarded the victim's last possessions. And yet, in the midst of this cold and callous scene, comes an astounding, powerful word from the criminal on the center cross. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. What in the world is Jesus thinking? In his last hour, Jesus is saying a prayer, a request to God. But notice that Jesus isn't asking something for himself. His prayer is one of complete unselfishness. He is concerned for the people who are responsible for crucifying him and is asking God to forgive them. Instead of thinking of himself and his own needs, he is thinking of those who have put him to death. Jesus, very literally, even unto death, embodied love. And that is because on Good Friday, everything changed. Jesus' death on the cross was a comprehensive demonstration of God's love for the entire world. Ultimately, none of us is forsaken, not you, not me, not the soldiers who pounded in those nails, for we are embraced by the God to whom Jesus calls out on the cross, the God who raised Jesus from the dead, and the God who holds us forever. We ask Jesus how much he loves us, and he responds by spreading out his arms and forming a cross and saying, This much, this much, thanks be to God. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him, saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Paradise. This is what Jesus promises us out of his unending mercy. In dying for us on the cross, Jesus gives us the promise that today we will be with him in paradise. In this story, we have two criminals, one who out of selfish ambition wants Jesus to have mercy on him in that moment and save yourself and us. Save us, Jesus. You have the power to do it. 
save us. But Jesus, in not saving himself, enacts true mercy, in humbling himself, in dying on the cross for us. And the second criminal says, recognizing that Jesus is a king, that Jesus does have a kingdom, and out of deep remorse and sorrow and confession says to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus gives this criminal more than he could have imagined. Jesus' mercy extends beyond what what this criminal could have imagined. Jesus does more than remember him. He promises him. He says, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. We are in a time that is negative beyond what we can imagine, that is scary beyond what we can imagine. We would have never imagined that we could not worship together on Holy Week or on Easter. We would have never imagined that a pandemic this bad could affect our country in this way. This is beyond what we can imagine. But yet we can still have hope in God's mercy, which is also beyond what our imaginations are capable of. God's mercy is abundant. It's beyond what we can think. It's more than remembering us. We have hope when we trust in this mercy. God remembers us this Holy Week. God is with us in our suffering, just like Jesus is with these two criminals in the cross on their suffering. He's sandwiched between the two of them on the cross, suffering alongside them out of love for them, out of love for us. Jesus suffers, and out of that we have the gift of grace, the gift of God's unending mercy. God's mercy is beyond what we can imagine. And Jesus promises us that today we will be with him in paradise. Amen. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. This is the word of the Lord. I wonder, I wonder whether or not the mother of Jesus and this disciple to whom Jesus speaks here, the one he loved but who is never named. I wonder if they had ever met the disciple and Jesus' mother. Were they at the party together, the wedding at Cana where Jesus' mother tells him, the wine has run out. I wonder if they were both there. I wonder if they came to the foot of the cross together or if they just saw one another there and thought, I know you from somewhere don't I? I wonder if they recognized each other or if they were two complete strangers finding themselves sharing a common grief, a common heartache. Scripture doesn't tell us. Oh, people try to figure it out. They try to give a name to the disciple whom Jesus loved, but the honest truth is we just don't know. And for me, For today, that is helpful. In fact, for me, for today, it is more than helpful. It is important. It's important because it leaves room for the disciple whom Jesus loves to be me or to be you, right? I mean, Jesus knows that where we find ourselves is hard really hard, at the foot of the cross, waiting for death, knowing that what comes next is the darkness of the tomb. It's really hard. And Jesus knows that we need one another and so gives us into one another's care. So to some, I look and say, I know you. We were at the wedding together at Cana. Remember? And to some I say, I think I know you. Didn't we walk 
together one time? To most, I say, I know you. No, we haven't met, but I know your anxiety. I know your grief. I know your fear and even your doubt. I know you. You are the disciple whom Jesus loved and loves still. Here, let's do this together. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabatani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In no other place in scripture is it as evident that Jesus has truly become human for our sake, for the sake of the world. Facing the darkness and the reality and the pangs of death in that moment. Resisting the the, the ability to, to save himself by supernatural means. Jesus lies on the cross, hanging there, suffering, allowing his body to cease to breathe for the sake of the world. In that moment, he feels the hopelessness and the helplessness that death brings and loss brings. And he faces it for our sake, out of the love that he has for us. He knows that this thing must happen. And he becomes aware, painfully so, of life if it were separated from God. The horror that that would bring, the the magnificent reality of, of how that would cease to be life at all. He felt the separation that comes when you don't know God. He did that so that we might have the promise of eternal life. We might know the joy of eternal salvation. So that as we face those moments of pain and hardship and even death, we might find comfort in knowing that we had a Savior that faced it all for our sake. A Savior who felt it all for our sake. A Savior who looked at death, was horrified, and leaned into it anyway. Can we, those who live on this side of eternity, recognize the need to be willing to face the pain of being a disciple, the struggles of being the disciple, the reality of the rejection and the horror and even the death that might come from being a disciple for the sake of our brothers and sisters? That not only did Jesus face that death for us, but expects us to do likewise. To see the sufferings and the pains of this life as something that gets us closer to God's plan of saving all people. That yes, sometimes we might too cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We might feel the loss and the grief and even the dying sometimes. But God recognizes the greater purpose. And that is the promise of eternal life with him. That we might suffer in this life, but we do so through the lens of hope in the peace of the life to come that lasts forever and ever because we had a savior that faced that death for our sake. Amen. Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture said, I'm thirsty. 
A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. I am thirsty. As I thought about the ways in which I've reacted to the words, the last words of Christ over my lifetime, it struck me that hearing woman, behold your son, behold your mother had a very new meaning to me after Robert was born. But the I am thirsty was probably the one I had a first reaction to. I could have been terribly old, but I knew enough to know that sour wine was a bad thing. It was not something you wanted or needed when you were thirsty. And I was mad at the they. So they put a sponge full of sour wine and gave it to our Lord. Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? How could they? Didn't they remember the least of these? And yet here we are, not only hearing of our Lord's thirst, but giving instead of water, sour wine. How quickly we forget. We forget that as the message tells it, Jesus took on flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. The flesh and blood part also means that pain, hunger, and thirst, all the things we feel, he felt. This Good Friday at home, Maybe something we'd like to quickly forget, but I hope not. I want to be that Easter person, but I know that to get there, we have to go through Good Friday. This year, we're going to do it virtually because we are walking it in reality. We are thirsty for fellowship and for being physically present with others. I miss asking the simple question, what would you like to drink? because that means there are people gathered around my table and I miss that. As we look forward, we know that things will look different when this crisis is passed. There will be feelings of grief, exhaustion, maybe anger, disbelief, but hopefully some of happiness and joy because they're all human feelings, all those feelings that Jesus felt. Jesus said, I am thirsty. This Good Friday, may we, maybe the first time that we hear that and understand, may we remember, may we remember the humanity of our Lord and a God who came down among us and loved us through Good Friday into Easter. Come, Lord Jesus. Therefore, when Jesus had received sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. I hate endings. I've seen loved ones die and sat with their families as tears have rolled down their cheeks. Endings mean that marriages are over and dreams are destroyed and addiction can keep us in its grip. And quite frankly, endings mean that we have to feel the worst things, like living through a global pandemic even now. And when I hear it is finished, I have the real human fear that God is going to stop the story there ended, final, period, feeling the worst things. And yet I know that when Jesus spoke those powerful words, it is finished. It's not so much about an ending, but an opening. In these words, Jesus is saying that God's work to open salvation to all is completed. God's work to take our worst things and not let them be the last is completed. God's work to take each ending that we feel and fight and fear is opening for God to do a new thing. As we see Jesus's head bow down, offering his spirit, 
There's a part of us that wants to skip, simply skip the suffering and pain. And yet the remarkable part of this ending is that it means that God is with us in the suffering to come. So feel it. The phrase, the full weight of it is finished as the worst thing, but not the last. It is finished as despair, feel it, but also as an opening to the hope of the new day. Beloved of God, it is finished. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour, because the sun was obscured, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had happened, he began praising God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. Last words matter, as in who gets the last word and what is the last word, from children arguing to adults dying. The last time I saw my dad alive, I was telling him goodbye and asked if I could do anything or get anything for him, and he said simply, my butt hurts. I told him I'd tell the nurse, I did on my way out, but getting into the car, I thought, my dad's in bad shape. I don't want those words to be the words I'll remember as the last words from him. So back down the long corridors I went and I told him I just didn't want that to be our last exchange. And he grinned and said, I love you. How's that? And I said, much better. I love you too. In fact, those were the last words. And last words matter. One of my least favorite hymns is In the Garden, but when old Zeb in Star Town with all of his children gathered around in ICU said 10 seconds before his monitor just completely flatlined, Pastor Tim, I want you to sing In the Garden at my funeral. You can bet I sang it because last words matter. Martin Luther reportedly on his deathbed was asked to sum up his life's work, 64 volumes worth, and he said, we are beggars. Well, that's all. We are beggars. This season of Lent has been about surrender, amplified, of course, by this tiny little virus bringing an entire arrogant and entitled world to its knees. Has not the past month reminded us, if nothing else, that we are beggars? We've got nothing apart from God. How poignantly Ash Wednesday now echoes, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Jesus models such hopeful surrender in his own last of the seven last words. Into your hands I commend my spirit. Not God's work, our hands, but done with God's work into God's hands. In those hands alone resides the impossible truth that Friday's words, real and devastating though they are, are never last, last. Even now, especially now, Sunday, Easter is coming, and that's a last last, last word worth both living and dying for. Thanks be to God and amen. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, 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 sometimes it 
it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they pierced him in the side? Were you there when they pierced him in the side? Oh, Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they pierced him in the side? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Let us pray, siblings, for the Holy Church throughout the world. Almighty and eternal God, you have shown your glory to all nations in Jesus Christ. By your Holy Spirit, guide the church and gather it throughout the world. Help it to persevere in faith, proclaim your name, and bring the good news of salvation in Christ to all people. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for Elizabeth and Tim, our bishops, and all servants of the church, and for all the people of God. Almighty and eternal God, your spirit guides the church and makes it holy. Strengthen and uphold our bishops, pastors, deacons, and other ministers and lay leaders. Keep them in health and safety for the good of the church. And help each of us in our various vocations to do faithfully the work to which you have called us. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for those preparing for baptism. Almighty and eternal God, you continue to bless the church. Increase the faith and understanding of those preparing for baptism. Give them new birth as your children and keep them in the faith and communion of your holy church. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for our sisters and brothers who share our faith in Jesus Christ. Almighty and eternal God, you give your church unity. Look with favor on all who follow Jesus, your son. Make all the baptized one in the fullness of faith and keep us united in the fellowship of love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for the Jewish people, the first to hear the word of God. Almighty and eternal God, long ago you gave your promise to Abraham and your teaching to Moses. 
Hear our prayers that the people you called and elected as your own may receive the fulfillment of the covenant's promises. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not share our faith in Jesus Christ. Almighty and eternal God, gather into your embrace all those who call out to you under different names. Bring an end to interreligious strife and make us more faithful witnesses of the love made known to us in your Son. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not believe in God. Almighty and eternal God, you created humanity so that all may long to know you and find peace in you. Grant that all may recognize the signs of your love and grace in the world and in the lives of Christians and gladly acknowledge you as the one true God. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for God's creation. Almighty and eternal God, you are the creator of a magnificent universe. Hold all the worlds in the arms of your care and bring all things to fulfillment in you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for those who serve in public office. Almighty and eternal God, you are the champion of the poor and oppressed. In your goodness, give wisdom to those in authority so that all people may enjoy justice, peace, freedom, and a share in the goodness of your creation, we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for those in need. Almighty and eternal God, you give strength to the weary and new courage to those who have lost heart. Heal the sick, comfort the dying, give safety to travelers. Free those unjustly deprived of liberty and deliver your world from falsehood, hunger, and disease. Hear the prayers of all who call on you in any trouble, that they may have the joy of receiving your help in their need. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Finally, let us pray for all those things for which our Lord would have us ask. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.